Hey guys, I hope all is going well. Um, today I'm going to show you how to implement difference in means and difference proportions tests in Excel. I got some cool examples that have been in the news recently and I was able to get up to date data. So one we're going to look at is the case fatality rate for coronavirus, which is an important question obviously. And then the other one we're going to look at that's been in the news a lot recently are um, fires in the United States, so wildfires. So I thought those were two cool examples. I was able to find this real data online this morning. I encourage you to start thinking about data for your project. Maybe look ahead and look what that project is about because your first task will be to collect data. And you'll want to collect two variables, an X and a Y. You'll want to start thinking about a question now in your mind would be good to think about is how does X affect Y? So how does income affect consumption is an example of that because we'd expect more income more consumption you'll be able to estimate an equation with the um to answer that question we don't have the tools for that yet but i encourage you not to do too much work just have in your mind i need to start thinking about a question how does x affect y and you'll also want to think about can you get data for x and can you get data for y those are the two things I want you to just start thinking about a little bit, and I'll continue to give you more information about the project as we move forward. But let's get to these difference in means and proportions tests. I'm going to hide my pretty face because it's probably going to freeze, which would be sad. So let's make this bigger. So the first research question that I came up with is right here, and it says... Was the COVID case fatality rate less at the end of August than at the end of April? Okay, so P1 is going to be the case fatality rate at the end of April, and P2 is going to be the case fatality rate at the end of August. P1 and P2 are both proportions because a fatality rate is the number of people who got something in the denominator and the number of people who died from it in the numerator. So that's a proportion. And so that's why I've labeled these things P. Um, based on that question, that's a left-tailed test, right? Less than. That's your key word right there is less. So based on that, we can set up a null and alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis will be true if the answer to that is false. The answer to the, or no. The answer to this will be no if the case fatality rate in August is greater than or equal to the case fatality rate in April. That would be no to this question if that were true, right? On the other hand, if this is true, if the case fatality rate in August is less than the case fatality rate at the end of April, then the alternative hypothesis is true and the answer to this research question is yes. We also want to go ahead and pick a sigma before we start doing our analysis. So we're going to go with 5%, which is really common. The other common levels, as I mentioned, are 1% or 10%. So 5% is kind of the middle ground. Now, to answer this question, I was able to get this data from Our World and Data's website this morning. There's a bunch of websites that have COVID data. Um, and this particular one, though, I got from Our World and Data. And so, of course, we're looking at the United States, or I don't know if I mentioned that. We're doing this for the United States, so that's why I got the United States data. And so you could do that for the world, or you could do it for any country, right? So those are cool things that you could think about if you're interested in analyzing this stuff. There's a lot of demand for anal analysis of this stuff, so maybe use that as an opportunity for yourself if you like statistics and working with numbers and stuff. But what we're going to do to make our estimates is we're going to take total deaths and divide by total cases. So notice there aren't any this early in the sample because this is before the pandemic hits, but as we scroll down, we see that total cases are increasing and total deaths are increasing. So what I did, we're not actually using a bunch of this data. We're looking for two rows specifically, and I already did this, but I'll show you where I got it. So we're looking end of April. Well, when's that? That's April 30th. So I just found April 30th. And our P bar, our estimate of the case fatality rate on that day is total deaths right here divided by total cases. 
And so I already got those numbers because I didn't want to spend a lot of time doing that. So I put them up here. So this is the total cases end of April, total deaths end of April. Now I actually have to be a little bit careful. I'm going to move these numbers down here real quick because these are the numbers from the row in the data, okay? But that's a, not exactly what we're wanting. Because if I just use these numbers, I'm actually still including cases and deaths from before April 30th in these numbers for the end of August, right? Because it's total cases and total deaths. So those include these cases and these deaths specifically. So how do I get rid of those? Well, if I do equals total cases at the end of August, I don't know why that highlighted more than one cell, so equals total cases at the end of August minus total cases at the end of April, what am I left with? Total cases between, right? So now similarly, if I do equals right here, and that's going to be total cases end of August, total deaths end of August minus total deaths end of April, and then there's that number. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste these as uh, values because I want to delete these numbers, which would be a problem if I had left the formula there. So delete that, delete that. Now we're good to go with those. So this is total deaths, total cases end of April, total deaths, total cases end of August. So p hat 1 is going to be equals total cases, or sorry, total deaths end of April divided by total cases end of April. That's 5.9 percentage, so that's pretty bad. Hopefully it went down. And then down here we're going to have total deaths end of August divided by total cases end of August. Oh cool, so it did go down by more than half really, right? So what these, let's just interpret these. These are interesting numbers. In, bef, at the end of April, the total number of deaths divided by the total of number of cases was almost 6%, which is a really high case fatality rate. That has dropped since to 2.5%, which is less than half of that number. So that's a really good sign. And so one thing we also want to do is do diff because that's actually what we care about is how much they change. That's going to be this number minus this number, which will be negative because they decreased, right? And they decreased by about 3.4%. So now that's kind of the number we're thinking about. Is that number statistically less than zero? And by using sigma of 5%, what I'm really asking is if the true difference between these two numbers is zero, then there should be, if there's a less than, or under the assumption that the difference is zero, there is, if there's a less than 5% chance of getting this or an extre more extreme difference, then I will reject the null hypothesis. And we'll talk about that again in a second. And we've seen that kind of in previous videos. The main difference here is we're looking at a difference between two unknowns instead of just one number. So if you look in your book in section 10.4, we actually have to create what's called a pooled estimate of the proportion in order to calculate the standard error, because we know we're going to need the standard error. And if you look in section 10.4, you'll be able to find this formula. But first, in order to use that formula, we actually take the average, or not, or actually a weighted average of these two numbers because we want to get one number for our calculation of the standard error. So to do a weighted average, I'm going to do first N1, which is going to be total cases as our actual, actually our sample size here, right? That's like how many people total could have died. These are how many did. These are how many got COVID, so potentially could have, and this is how many did. So this is like our N1 for April, and this is like N2 for August. So to do a weighted average, I'm going to open parentheses, and I take this number right here, and I multiply it by the estimate associated with that number right here. 
add n2 times p2. And so I'm basically just multiplying this estimate by how many observations were used to get that estimate, right? So that's what a weighted average is. And then I'm going to divide by these two numbers added up again, this plus this. And so that's going to give us a weighted average. Notice that we end up a lot closer to this estimate when we do the weighted average. The reason for that is that we have a much bigger sample size for that estimate. And that's why our pooled estimate is what this is called, is more weighted towards the lower number because a bigger sample was used to calculate that number. So we actually have more confidence in that estimate than we do in this one. Okay. Well, now we're ready to, to do the standard error. And again, this formula is available in your book. You'll have access to those resources when you do tests and homework and stuff. So I'm not going to just repeat that information for you. I encourage you to just have a sheet or the book or a computer screen with those formulas available to you. Because I don't think memorizing formulas is a great um, use of your time anyway. It's not something that really makes sense to do with all of the potential formulas to memorize. So just use the resources available to you. But now we can calculate our standard error. So that's going to be the square root. And this is, formula is also available in section 10.4. Similar, but a tiny bit different than the ones you've seen in the past where we only had one sample. So we do our pooled estimate right here times 1 minus our pooled estimate, which is similar to what you've seen before. But actually, in this case, I'm going to add some extra parentheses because here we have to do a similar thing that we did to the weighted average. We're going to multiply this by 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. And that's the same thing really as divide, kind of similar to just dividing by the sum of those numbers. Okay. And I think, do I need another parenthesis? I don't think so. Push enter. Oh, yeah, that looks right. Looks like I was missing the end of the square root parenthesis. So we have a pretty small standard error. Why do we have such a small standard error? Because we have huge sample sizes. That's why we get a small standard error. So that's nice. And now we, of course, are ready to calculate our Z statistic. Our Z statistic is going to be our difference divided by the standard error of our difference. So this equals the difference divided by the standard error of the difference. And that is a massive Z statistic. Why is that so huge? That's so huge because our standard error is tiny relative to the difference that we observed. We probably don't even have to go look at a z-table or use our formula right now because you should know just from experience at this point that if we are 183 standard errors into the tail of a z-distribution, we are crazy, crazy far into the left tail. Like you've seen in the past, if you're more than three, that's a crazy outcome. This is saying this is 183. So in other words, let's interpret this again. If these two numbers are actually equal and the difference I'm observing here is just the result of random sampling stuff going on, random craziness, then there is a, that is crazy that we landed that far away. To see how crazy it is, we could do the probability of being less than Z because we're doing a left tailed test. So we're going to look in that left tail. So we want the probability of being less than this number. Well, that equals norm dot dist. Our z statistic, 0, 1, true. Notice I don't have to do anything special in this case because I am doing a left-tailed test. And this formula always gives me probabilities to the left of the number that I give it. And it's just 0. Why is that so tiny? It's not technically zero, but it's such a tiny number that Excel is like, this is basically zero. It's rounding it from like 0 0.0000000 000 
tons of zeros before you ever get to a number. So that is a tiny probability. So zero is less than 5%. And that means we reject the null hypothesis. And what we conclude is that we find evidence that yes, indeed, the case fatality rate was statistically less at the end of August than at the end of April. Okay, so that's how we conclude that now. We can't say it's statistically less again just by looking at these numbers because that difference could be the result of random just volatility happening in the data. However, once we see this tiny probability or this huge magnitude on this z-set, then we can say this difference is statistically different, statistically less than. Okay, so that's an example of a difference in proportions test, real world up-to-date data. So I thought that was a cool example, and it's good news, that's nice. This is, we've statistically decreased the case fatality rate of COVID in the United States, so I thought that was cool, good news. It's still too high, but at least it's moving in the right direction. So another data set I found were, were um, wildfires in the United States. Since that data actually goes back before 1984, but the website I got this from mentioned that the measurement was different before 1984. So that's why I decided to just use these numbers. And then the research question we're going to ask here is, were U.S. acres burned per year by wildfire greater in the 2001 to 2010 period? So this period right here. Actually, I'm going to change this. Why did I do 2000 to 2010? Let's do 2000 to 2019. And let's do... Let's just use all the data, 84 to 2000. So now we're just using all of our data. I don't know what I was thinking when I stopped in 2010. Did I forget that it's not 2010 for a second? That's probably what happened. So let's go right here. We can do a keyboard short. Oops. We're going to define mu first. So let's shift these down. On a Mac, if you do um, option M, I want to say, whew, you get a mu. So let's say mu equals, actually mu1, because we have two samples, equals pre, or let's say 1984 to 2000 true average acres burned. And then option M2 or mu2 equals 2001 to 2019 acres burned. So now my null hypothesis is going to be true if the answer to this question is a no. That will be the case if. option mu one is actually let's do two because that's how the question is kind of posed greater in that period so in the mu two period than in the 1984 to 2000 period so i'll say mu two less than or equal to mu one because if mu two if there are the acres burned is less in the 2001 to 2019 period or equal to the 1984 to 2000 period, then the answer to this question would be no, right? So that's why that's the null hypothesis. Again, that always includes equality. Notice I'm using a mu now because we're talking about means or averages instead of proportions. You can actually do it however you want, but I like to do that just to remind myself because as you know, things change a little bit when we're doing proportions or means. So now, of course, the alternative hypothesis will be the opposite of that, mu one greater than mu two. And in that case, the answer to this question will be yes, because that would mean that they were actually greater than. We'll use sigma 5% again. 
And so I'm actually going to organize my data a little bit differently. You could use this data set for what I'm about to show you, but I like to stay organized. So I'm going to do, I'll copy year over. So we're going to do 2001 to 2019 first. So let's do copy those dates and go over here. So that's 2001 to 2019 data. Go over here and paste that. And now I'm going to say year again, which is fine for that. But here I'm actually going to say, you don't need that one. This is acres. So this is acres less than 2001. That'll just remind me when I look later, these are my years, or sorry, no, less than 2001 greater than 2001. That will remind me that these are the years after 2001, or maybe I should say 2000 since 2001 is concluded or included. And then let's go back over here. So now we're going to grab the bottom of the data set. Copy that here, year, this is going to be not something we need because those are number of fires. We could ask a research question about that too, right? Acres, in this case, less than 2,000. And this is just a way to remind me which section I'm in because you'll see I'm going to use a new tool in a second that is available to you and I encourage you to use because it's probably the way that most people would do this in the real world because we could start saying things like x bar 1, x bar 2 and then use all of our formulas and I encourage you to practice that too but I'm going to show you a new way to do it and this is going to be available to you I think in the Excel stats stuff in the book but I encourage you to get this on your own computer. And that's the data analysis tool pack. This is an Excel add-in that is free, but there's a good chance that you need to turn it on. Now, on a Mac, it's very easy to do that. If we go up here and we say tools, Excel add-ins, I just have analysis tool pack clicked on that causes this to appear. If you're on a Windows machine, you have to go to over to options um, and then add-ins and then go through just one or two extra steps, but just Google it. It's very easy to do. But in order to do what I'm about to show you, you first need to do that. So let me know if you have any questions about getting that on your computer though. So I'm going to go ahead and open this. And then actually all of the four bottom things here are different difference in means tests. Now we did not use this for the last problem because that was a proportion problem and we know there are special things about that and Excel will not recognize that those are proportions. So now we have to actually make a decision about which of these we want to use. Now first we want to ask do we have a paired or what the book refers to as a matched sample? No, we do not have a matched sample in this case, or a paired sample. One way we can immediately recognize that is you would always have the same number of observations in both groups if you had a paired sample. So that immediately makes it clear that we do not have a paired sample. So that one is out. Now these two, we can decide which one of these prefer. So should we assume that these, this data has the same variance as this data, or should we not? This really is up to the analyst. The way that I like to do it is let's go just look and say, and I actually prefer to look at the standard deviation because the variance gets blown up because it's squared. So it's generally easier to compare standard deviations. So sample standard deviation, this, And then standard deviation, this. And now those numbers are pretty far apart. So I'm going to go ahead and be safe and assume that they're not equal. Now, if we assume equal, that actually gives our tests a little bit more power. But 
at the cost of the risk of making a type one error. And so I talk about type one and type two errors in that homework help video. So if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say that, I encourage you to check that one out. But based on this comparison of standard deviations, those numbers are pretty different. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose assuming unequal variances. So I'll push okay here. And now I can just tell Excel what my two variables are. So variable one range, I'm just gonna go and click that. Variable two range, I'm just highlighting this data. Notice I included those labels. Because I did that, I need to click labels right here. Also, the hypothesized mean difference is the difference under the null hypothesis. That's gonna be zero. You actually don't have to type the zero there. If you don't, Excel will assume that it's zero. So you actually don't have to put anything there unless you want something other than zero, which is pretty rare. Now alpha, oops, I just realized that I've been calling alpha sigma, sorry about that, level of significance is 5%. So you can leave that the same. But if you're ever doing this in the for homework or, or something, they might tell you 1%, 2%, 10%. And you'll want to change this number right here. I like to put the output next to my data, so I'll click output range. And then down here, I can just pick where I want my results to go. I'll put them right there. I push OK. I double click the sky open. And so we see here, these are actually our means. These are our before or after 2000 and before. So we actually don't get the estimated difference, which is a little bit annoying with Excel. So we wanna do this difference right here. That is the difference between these two numbers. So it's pretty big, but we don't know if it's statistically significant yet before going down a little bit, right? Well, so now we know this is a one-tailed test because we said greater than. We did not tell Excel that. So what Excel does is it just tells us the results of whether it's one or two. And uh, some of these things make sense. So like this probability for two tail is exactly double the one tail probability, for example. So, and you should know that. So recognize those patterns over time. And on future Canvas exams, I will show you results from stuff like this, and then I'll ask you questions about it. So be prepared for that too. Here's our two different sample sizes right here. And now we don't really even have to do those formulas. Excel did all the work for us, and we can just go look at this p-value. When p-values are really small, we saw in the last example that sometimes it'll just get rounded to zero. This one isn't quite that small, but it is really small again. And this is in scientific notation. So what this number actually is, is this minus five means that there's actually four zeros after the decimal point before we get to a number. So that number is point zero 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 one three. So that number is less than 5%, which means we should reject the null hypothesis. And what that means is we go back and say, instead of stopping there, we go back and say, well, what was the original question? Were U.S. acres burned per year by wildfire greater in 2001 to 2019 period than 1984 to 2000 period? Yes, they were statistically significantly greater because we rejected the null hypothesis at the 5% level. Now, what's nice about the p-value approach, too, is we could say, oh, by the way, this number is also less than 1%. So if I had chosen the 1% level, let's change this for you so it doesn't say sigma when I send it to you. So alpha is what that should have been. If we had done 1%, we still would have rejected the null hypothesis because this number is also less than 1%. It's also less than 10%, of course. So we would have rejected the null hypothesis at any conventional level of significance. All right, so I'm gonna change this alpha from sigma to alpha two. That was a mistake. Please let me know if you have any questions about this, but this is how you implement difference in means and difference in proportions in Excel. So for proportions, we had to do the legwork because Excel doesn't really offer a package for that. 
means we could have done the legwork. You could do all these numbers on your own. And I think a good exercise for students to learn about this is try it with the formulas and then do the way the data analysis way, and then just make sure you get the same answers both way, and that'll help you just see those patterns. All right, let me know if you have any questions about this video, and this should really get you to the end of chapter 10 homework, I believe, especially given the um, section two help video, um, but I'll talk to you guys soon.